Welcome everybody. <clears throat> this is episode 22 where we're going to start a new project which is to make a uh, top-down 2D RPG. Uh, so a lot of our previous uh, projects have involved procedural generation like simplex noise and <clears throat> the evolving pictures. So we're not going to do that this time. We're going to have a game where you can handcraft levels. And typically uh, if you want to have a game like that, it's useful to create a, a level editor of some kind. Uh, but what we're going to do for now, at least, is just use a text editor as our level editor. And so what we can do, let's start a, a new folder for the RPG. I'm just going to call it RPG. <clears throat> and. Uh, Another thing we're going to do is we're going to keep <clears throat> we're going to try to keep the game logic for the RPG separate from the code that uh, renders it, and that could have a few advantages. One is that it'll let us swap in a different render if we want to. So like we could have like an old school uh, text rendering if we wanted to, like NetHack looks kind of like this. Um, but we could also have, uh, you know, like a two D graphical uh, interface, or we could have even a three D interface. Like we could plug in whatever kind of renderer we want. Uh, the main one we're going to work on, we're going to use um, some tiles from Open Game Art. Uh, let's see. There's a huge. Let's see. Dungeon crawl, stone soup. Here we go. Then there's this bigger one. Yeah, so this is the, the tile sheet <coughs> we're going to use. This is one big uh, PNG with 32 by 32 tiles. And we're going to use these. Uh, on the render we're going to work on. So we will have all of these things to choose from when designing a dungeon, potentially. So you've got walls, weapons, creatures, and so on. So this is what we're going to use. And I've got a, uh, a zip file set up. Uh, what was the file name? Tiles. So if you go to gameswithgo.org slash rpg slash tiles.zip, and I'll put that in chat, uh, you can download <coughs> that PNG file. And this is a uh, public domain art, uh, but you should always uh, provide attribution, even though they don't require it if you were to release this to other people. Okay, so these would be the tiles we're working with. And it's gonna be a, <clears throat> a 2D game, so we're gonna have uh, some way to represent what the world looks like. And we're gonna use a two-dimensional array for that. Now in the past projects, when we've been representing images, oh, my one-year-old daughter was drawing. When we've represented uh, 2D images, we use just a one-dimensional array, just one big long array for the whole image. And the reason you do that for images is for performance reasons. Uh, when you have just one array, then when you iterate over it to read pixels or change pixels, um, you're always going in order in memory. And remember, that's the fast way to access memory, is to go in order, because every time you request one piece of data, you get a bunch of pieces of data that are next to it at the same time. And then you <clears throat> can get those for free in your CPU's cache. Um, so a two-dimensional array is really just an array of arrays. So let's say we had a uh, two-dimensional array with two rows and this many columns in each row. 
Um, the way it would actually work, oh, that's too many, is your first array would <coughs> just have pointers to each individual row. Right, so when you iterate down a row, it's fast, but every time you go to the next row, you've got to hop to a new location of memory, so it's not quite as quick. For a huge image that's millions of pixels, that's a big deal. For uh, an RPG map that is maybe you know a thousand tiles, that is not a big deal. It'll be fine, and it'll be more convenient because then we can access things um, by xy coordinates without having to do math to change an index into xy coordinates. So we're going to use a two-dimensional array to represent uh, each level. And we're going to use a text editor to build the levels. And we're going to try to keep the game logic and the rendering logic completely separate and see how that goes. OK, so <clears throat> we got our main RPG folder. So we're going to do a, uh, we'll do a game folder and a UI folder, because we're going to keep those things separate. So in our uh, UI folder, <clears throat> make another subfolder there. That's where our tile sheet's going to go, because our tile sheets uh, <clears throat> are only relevant to the UI. The game's not going to even know about them. So let's unzip this. Let's just open it. I wonder if we can drag. Nope. So we do it the old fashioned way. RPG, UI, assets. All right, so we'll have the <coughs> tiles now available in here. Too large for VS Code to handle. That's too bad. All right, <clears throat> then in the game, we'll have a folder for our maps. And let's go ahead and make one. So that'll give us something to start trying to accomplish, is to like draw a map. So let's make a new file, and we'll just call it level1.map. So the format for these files is going to be real simple. We're basically just going to draw uh, the level that we want to see. And an extension you might want to add if you're using VS Code to edit. I learned today that um, VS Code does not make the insert key work properly, which is insane. So if you add this uh, extension called overtype, you can just search for overtype in here and install it. It will make the insert key work properly. And what that means, if you hit insert, you should be able to just type over things instead of before things. And that'll be handy <clears throat> when we're trying to draw, basically draw with our text editor. So let's make, um, let's just decide that we will use this pound symbol for a normal stone wall. And let's make a little room. And we'll just draw it. Like overhead view. And then we will use a period for like a standard dirt floor. This will be like our basic dungeon floor. Let's do one more. So I want to put the door in the middle. And we could use a pipe to indicate a door and make a little hallway. And then we'll have a second room on the other side. And we can just copy and paste this. All right, so we'll have a very basic room. It's got a few elements in it. Uh, oh, we need a, a floor there. <clears throat> we'll have uh, walls, doors, so we can start trying to open and close doors and floor tiles. So we'll start out with this and we'll start trying to read it in and, and do something with it. 
So let's start our <coughs> our game. Let's call it game.go package game. Uh, so we're going to have some representation of a level. Uh, so let's make a level struct. And the main thing that's going to have for now is the 2D array that represents uh, represents the map. So we'll call that the call the map. And to do a to indicate you want a two-dimensional array, you just have an array of an array. So it's two arrays. And then we need some type here. And I think what we'll do is uh, the type that Go uses for characters is called a, a rune, R-U-N-E. And <clears throat> that's kind of convenient because runes kind of sounds like an RPG thing anyway. So um, let's just call it tile. Let's see how that goes. Um, and the tile is just going to be an alias for a rune. And that'll let us create an enum where we can define uh, all of our different types, types of tiles. So we can have a, a stone wall, and that's going to equal the pound sign we were using, dirt floor, the period, and uh, door, pipe. And so this will just be an array of tiles. Oh, we need to indicate that this is a tile. Does that make all of these tiles? Okay. Oh, you know what? We can't call it map because map is a reserved word in Go. Um, RPG map. Oh, you know, we can call it capital map, and we're going to want to export this anyway because the renderer is going to need to know about the level and the map and the tiles. So, all this stuff will need to be ex exported. And remember to export things so that other packages can see them. Um, use, just use a capital letter. Oh, why is it unhappy? Oh, tile. All right, <clears throat> so we're starting to flesh out how we're going to represent the level. We'll have an array and a, of an array of tiles. We have an enum set up so we can <clears throat> refer to things by name rather than by the bizarro character they are. Okay, so we need to load um, our map into it and, and make a level out of it somehow. So let's give that a try. Let's do a load level from file. That's a function. It will take in a <coughs> file name and return a level. OK, so loading from files. We've done that before. Um, I guess back in the balloons project was the first time. What was it? Image file. Yeah, image file to texture. Um, but what we want to do is kind of read this line by line, like a text file, if we can. And usually, uh, languages have a way to do that. So let's see. So <clears throat> one way you can read uh, read from a file is you just you just get all the bytes in a big array. But sometimes you can read line by line when you want to work with a text file. So we've got the read line in buffio. Um, 
Okay, so this works the same way that you read a line from the console, but you provide it the bytes from your file, it sounds like. Or we can use scanner. Scanner does not work well if lines longer than 65,000 characters. That's going to be okay. So let's try that. <clears throat> See how it goes. So we're going to use a scanner. So we're going to need to import some things. We're going to import uh, OS, that's going to let us open files, and Buff.io is going to get us a scanner. So we'll get our file, we'll call os.open, and then path will be uh, maps level one.map. This might actually end up being, so we're gonna run the game from a main function uh, in the root directory of RPG. So this might end up being a game slash map slash level one dot map. <clears throat> oh, we're gonna pass it a file name, so file name. Check for error. Then use fur to uh, close. All right, so we're gonna get a scanner. We use the buff.io package for that. And we pass <coughs> uh, the file. So new scanner expects an uh, IO reader, which I believe is an interface and files satisfy that interface so we can pass it a file. So we can say for scanner.scan this is just going to be the test that we're successfully reading. We'll print out the text. That's it. I need to import format. Okay, why is this unhappy? Undefined file name. Types go after. Okay. For now, we'll just return nil because we're just testing. <clears throat> okay, then let's go to our root directory. Let's make our uh, main file. So package main func main, <clears throat> and then we're going to want to import our game package. Let's see. When we do that, <clears throat> I never can remember the exact syntax to do that. Import an inner package. You just got to go all <clears throat> through the full path. So. So let's export this just so we can test it real quick.
load level from file. Game maps level one dot map. Okay, success. So we're successfully reading line by line. Uh, but now, instead of uh, just printing the text, we need to start constructing our, uh, our level. So first thing is we'll need to know how many rows and columns are in the map. So I think what we'll want to do is when we run this scan, we'll build up an array of strings. So call this level lines. And that'll be a, a slice of strings. <clears throat> we do like this. Level lines equal to make a slice of strings start out <clears throat> at zero. And then each time we go through here, we'll say level lines equals append level lines scanner.text. So this is going to build up uh, an array of strings. So we'll have an array for each, uh, the array will have a string for each row of our level. And then the other thing I want to do is <coughs> get the uh, longest keep track of the longest row because that'll tell us how many columns the level has. So we'll start it out equal to zero and <clears throat> we'll just keep track. So Start at index equal to zero. If level lines of index, uh, how do we get the length of a string? Can we just say length? Greater than longest row. Longest row equals length of the line. and increment our index each time through. <clears throat> so at the end of this, we'll know our, the size that our <clears throat> map needs to be for both dimensions. So we can say, uh, we do level, We'll just make a blank one, a zeroed out, zeroed out level. <clears throat> and then we can say uh, level dot map. Let's see. How do we build this up? Okay, so yeah, we make a two-dimensional array of tiles and the length of it is gonna be the length of just the first array, which is gonna to correspond to the Y coordinates, right? That's how many, uh, how many rows we have. So the Y axis up and down. So that's gonna be the length of level lines, how many lines we have.
And then we need to go through each um, go through each row and make an array for the row. We're going to make each row the same length as the longest row uh, for now. That'll just be simpler to work with. You could make it <clears throat> what's called a jagged uh, two-dimensional array where each row is a, a different length, which would like minimize how much memory you waste. Um, but I think that will be painful later on. But we'll see. We could we could change this. Okay, so at this point, we can return a level, which is a 2D array of tiles. So I think that's all we need to start I'm not using format anymore, so we got to delete it. I think that's all we need to start trying to pass a level onto the renderer to render it. So how are we going to do that? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make up a <clears throat> an interface and we're going to say the, <clears throat> the game interface is going to have to have uh, a draw function that takes in a level. lowercase interface. So <clears throat> um, when we start a game, we're going to pass it a UI. And then the game will call that UI. So let's just get the, a start for that. We'll say, uh, I'm going to make this not exported now. What we're going to have exported is a run. And this will take a UI. And then we will uh, load level from file. Other slash. So we get our level. And then we're going to pass. A level to our draw function. This will take a pointer to a level. All right. <clears throat> Any questions in chat about how we're organizing this? Or concerns? I'm doing this on the fly. It could it could all go wrong. Okay, let's go to our UI folder and make a UI.go. I guess we could call this UI2D. I'm going to rename it. Rename UI2D. That doesn't work. Maybe because I'm in it. Yeah, that's probably why. There we go. It's changed. Okay, package UI2D. <clears throat> um, Just 
just have an empty struct for now. And we'll make a draw function on it. And that'll take in a level. <clears throat> and in order to know about levels, this will need to import the game. Game not known. Level is exported. Oh, this probably needs uh, undefined level. Why? It's finding it. Oh, I know why. We have to say game. <clears throat> so unless you use the dot notation, you have to specify your package before the type. All right, so we're just going to test that we uh, got anything. This will just test that all of our wiring works at all. Okay. And then this is going to import the UI 2D. This is our main function. So game.run, and then we'll say uh, UI2D dot So make it more clear. We'll say our UI is equal to the address of UI 2D dot UI 2D. And we'll just pass UI. Okay, so now main creates a UI object, UI struct, <coughs> which satisfies the draw method that takes in a level. And then it passes that to the game to run it. So we run it. And we collect, uh, <coughs> get a level. And then draw it. For now, all the drawing does is say we did something, just to see if everything works. Everything does not work. Let's see. Cannot find the path specified. That should be single case, uh, singular. Okay. okay, there we go. We did something. So the framework is operational, but now what we want to do is try to draw our tiles instead of just saying we drew something. <clears throat> okay, so this is gonna need all of our SDL stuff that we've done in the past on uh, things like the balloon project and the evolving pictures project. Um, and one thing I think we can do, if we look at the balloons project, we have a lot of initialization stuff that we do in the main function. So one way we can make this work is we could create like an initialize function in here that's part of the uh, part of the game UI interface that you have to call first. But Golang's got a feature for initialization functions that I think will run when it starts up. So let's see how those work and see if we can get all our uh, SDL stuff set up in them. So.
There we go. When is the init function run? So I think we could just make a function called init, do all of our SDL initialization, and that will do what we expect. It will run before, uh, before the main function does. So let's try it. <clears throat> I'll put a print line in here just as we can see the order of operations. I guess we can test that now, so let's try it. Okay, yes, init ran, even though we never called it, just magically ran uh, before anything else happened. That's what we want, good. So what we're gonna do here is kinda of rip off everything from SDL, <clears throat> from our SDL code in the balloons. So let's take, uh, this is the import we need. <clears throat> this will import the SDL library. Then we want all this stuff. So we'll to go to the main function. I'm going to grab all of this setup stuff. I'm grabbing a little bit of stuff we'll have to delete, but that's no big deal. Okay, dumping all of that into init. And then let's yank out stuff that is not relevant anymore. So this will be... RPG, not exploding balloons. Uh, win width and height, let's define that. Do a 720p window for now. So if you're just joining for the first time, <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> this sets up uh, SDL and creates a window. This, this tells SDL to like get, get started and hit everything. This creates a window at position 200, 200 at this width and height. And this creates a renderer, which is what we're going to use to draw textures. And indicating that you want accelerated means it'll use your GPU. So it'll use DirectX or OpenGL, depending on what operating system you're on. And we use these defers to clean up all these resources. Uh, when we're done with them, when the function, uh, oh, you know what? We don't want to do this. We got to get rid of these defers because the init's going to exit <clears throat> before we're done. So we'll have to clean those up differently. So delete those defers. And then we're not going to do any sound yet. So let's delete all this sound stuff. And then this, um, this is a hint that you tell SDL that you want to do bilinear filtering on textures. If you draw them bigger or smaller than they actually are, it'll make them look nicer. Okay, why is this unhappy? Render declared and not used. That's okay. So renderer is going to be uh, global. So we're going to say, say pointer to an SDL renderer. And then instead of a, uh, declaring and assigning, we're just going to assign. So our renderer is going to get created. And we'll have access to it when the game starts running. OK, the other thing we need to do in here is load up our uh, texture, our, or our tiles. So um, sometimes these things are referred to as uh, texture atlases when you have a huge uh, image full of different textures that you're going to use. And the reason you put them all in one file is just for efficiency. It's more efficient to load one file with all your images or a lot of your images than it is to load hundreds of files or thousands of files. So like this, <clears throat> this has like 3,000 separate images. Loading those as separate files into separate textures would be, there'd be a lot of overhead. So you just load one, and then when you want to draw things, you just tell it which area to draw. All right. 
So texture atlas is going to be an SDL texture. And we're going to want to load that from a file. So we'll do, um, I think again, we can rip off from balloons two. Uh, image file to texture. So I'm going to copy that and I will explain what it does. So it's going to take a string, <coughs> return a texture. So we get a file handle from the OS, so we'll need to import OS here. Check for error. <coughs> it's okay to close the file because we're going to be done with it. Uh, we use the built-in uh, PNG stuff in the Go library to decode the PNG. Um, we need to import that. And that's an image slash PNG. So that's built into the Go standard library to decode images. Oh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm still in my head used to C, C sharp syntax where types go first. All right, so we get an image from the PNG decoder. And that's like a special type that the standard library returns. We get the width and height of it. <clears throat> And then we sort of extract an array of pixels in the format we want to use for SDL from this. So we make a pixel slice and we iterate <coughs> over the image and create an array of pixels. And if you wanted to do this more efficiently, SDL has its own PNG decoder that can directly create a texture. Uh, that would be faster, but you have to um, add the SDL image extension, which is a bunch of infrastructure work you have to do. But if you wanted to like release something with optimum performance, you'd probably want to grab, grab that and, and do it. Okay, so pixels to texture. Okay, so we're going to go to balloons 2 again. Oh, this, this doesn't need to be its own separate function, so it won't be. Okay, so once this loop is done, we have an array of pixels in the format that SDL, one of the formats that SDL knows how to use. So we're gonna create a texture. So you can call render.createTexture and you give it the format you want. This um, will be red, green, blue, alpha, 8888. <clears throat> um, texture access streaming. We probably don't need this to be streaming. This is never gonna change. So we'll call it texture access static. That just tells SDL what you intend to do with it, whether you intend to change the texture often or never, and it can optimize things based on that. Okay, if there's an error, we're gonna panic, <clears throat> and then we update the texture with our pixel array. And then finally, we can set a blend mode. What this does is it lets the transparency work. Uh, S smashing SF, you're asking if there is an index for it. Index for what? I didn't see when you posted that, so I'm not sure what you mean. So this blend mode uh, tells SDL to do alpha blending, which means that these tiles where you see white here in MS Paint, that will be see-through. Ah, okay, so uh, smashing SF is asking if we have an index for the atlas, and no, we're going to be making one very soon. But that's a good question. So for now, all we're doing is getting the huge texture atlas loaded in to one texture. And for fun, we can try drawing that in the draw. Uh, so we can say renderer.copy uh, texture atlas. <clears throat> so render.copy will take a texture sort of copy it to the screen, <clears throat> and it could take in a source and destination, which means you could tell it, grab only one part of the texture atlas and draw it to only one part of the screen, or if you just want to take the whole thing, draw the whole thing to the screen, you can pass a nil. Uh, let's, see if, let's see if all this works. 
Invalid texture. Why are we an invalid texture? Oh, <clears throat> we're an invalid texture because we never called this. That's why. So in our init, we need to say image file to texture. And that'll be game slash UI 2D assets slash tiles. Fair enough, SDL. You can't render nil. Cannot find tiles. Oh, it's not in game. It's just in UI 2D. I think we also need to call renderer.present. Then I'll delay for five seconds just so we can see it. Okay, cool. Texture loaded. We can draw the whole thing. So now what we got to do is draw just pieces of it. <clears throat> and to do that, we're going to need, as chat noticed, an atlas or an index. And what an index is, is some data that tells you where things are. So if you say, I want to draw the stone wall, it can tell you, okay, the stone wall is at this X and this Y coordinate right here. And then you could draw just that piece of the texture atlas. <clears throat> um, and that does not uh, exist yet, so we got to make it. And <clears throat> we will do that, um, I guess, inside assets. So we'll call it uh, uh, atlas index. Dot text. And so we have to come up with some file format that we're going to use to do this. Um, you could use something like uh, JSON or XML and use a JSON or XML library to load it. Um, but what I'm going to show here is how you can keep things much simpler than that. You can avoid having to import an entire JSON library uh, just to load a really simple file format. And in fact, I think this will be simple enough. We won't even have to use the Lexer and Parser we built for the evolving pictures. We'll see. It's possible this could grow in complexity and we decide that we do want to do that. But for now, we should be able to load this with really just a few lines of simple parsing using string functions. So what we're going to do is each line will indicate how, uh, where to get the tiles for a certain uh, type in the game. So currently our game has just three, stone wall, uh, dirt floor and door. And then a nice feature we can add is <clears throat> we can make it such that when you load a stone wall that you don't just grab one of them, but you could grab like any of these randomly. So if you draw a stone wall in your text file here, then it'll end up kind of picking some of these variations on the stone wall uh, randomly. So it'll give some you know, variety to your level. And so what I was thinking is we could indicate that, that a type can uh, start at some x, y coordinate and then <clears throat> continue on some number of times, right? So for here, we can figure out the x, y of this and then say it's <clears throat> it starts here and then it can be any one of the next one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or whatever it is, tiles. So really all we need in our format is uh, the symbol that we're going to look up, and then three numbers, the x, the y, and the span. That'll be what we want to know. Um, in fact, for now, let's keep, let's keep the span out. We might add that next time. We'll keep it simple. We'll just do x and y. So <clears throat> to get the x and y of these things, we can, uh, I'm using MS Paint. If you're an expert at a real image program, feel free to use it. Um, so I'm just going to look down at the bottom left, it shows the X and Y coordinate, 335, 593. I'm just going to use a calculator. These are all 32 by 32. So we can divide by 32. Truncate 10 is the X coordinate of the stone wall. So we'll say 10. And then, <clears throat> what was it? 5, 590.
18. So 10, 18 should get us our stone wall. And then we need our dirt floor, which is a period. And let's see, where was the nice dirt? We'll use this one here. So that's 1361. Oh, 1361 divided by 32. That is incorrect. Oh, it's not using wrong, wrong divide. Uh, 42 for the X. And 240, or it's just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7 for the Y. And then we have doors represented by a pipe. And <clears throat> what's a good door? We can use this door. That looks like a regular door. Um, here we can just count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 17 comma 1, I think. We'll find out if it's wrong. All right, <clears throat> so now the UI is going to need to load that index too. So what's our index going to look like? Our index should probably be a, a map. So maybe we can use a go map for the first time. So um, how do we do go like maps? Let's see. Go maps in action. Okay. So key then value. So these will be, what do we call tiles? This will be, <coughs> it will map from a tile to an SDL rectangle. Okay, and so if you're not familiar with maps, uh, basically they're, they're a data structure that lets you um, add things to them with a key. So <clears throat> you could add a, uh, you know, if you had a map of int to strings, you could add hello world with the integer number one, um, a goodbye with integer number two, and then later you can look up those strings by passing the key. So if you pass in a one, you'll get back the string for hello world. If you pass in two, you'll get the string for goodbye. And generally these are implemented either uh, with hash tables or with uh, trees of some kind, such that the lookup speed is extremely quick. Either uh, O of one, which means no matter how many things are in the map, you can get back uh, the thing you want in the same amount of time, in constant time, no matter how big it gets. Or if it's a tree, it'll be something like uh, log of n, which is still very, very fast. Uh, so we need to build this up, uh, which means let's see, we'll make a new function load index. One thing we need to do too is figure out how to get these paths all sorted out without having them all hard coded eventually. Uh, 
not just me. All right, then we'll want to use the same kind of approach we used in load level from file uh, using a scanner. So we're going to need buff IO. Check for error. Okay, so at this point we'll have <clears throat> a line of our atlas index. So a couple things we can do just to clean up uh, this to make it easy to, to parse is we could trim it. Uh, we'll need the strings library. And we're gonna wanna trim white space off the beginning and end. So you can just say trim space. Okay. So what that'll do is just if you have any trailing white space before or after, it'll yank it out. So it's a little bit more uh, resilient to us typing in strange things. So we're gonna wanna get the first uh, rune from the string. So that'll be our tile character, the tile rune. Uh, can we just say line of zero for that? Yes. <clears throat> and then we're going to want to see cast that to the tile. I think we could just say that game that tile. Okay, <clears throat> so now we've got a tile. And now we need to build our rectangle. So <clears throat> we need the X and Y from our rectangle. So let's see. Uh, what we want to do is take the X, Y portion of our string is going to be Can we do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this should get the rest of the line after the first character. So it should get all of this. And then we want to split it by commas. And to do that, Probably just strings dot split. Yes. <clears throat> so we give the string x y and the separator, which will be comma. And what that should give us is an array of strings. So x will equal to. We're going to need string convert. Parse int. Y. I think parsent can return Oh, 
it needs more arguments. Uh, base, base 10, bit size 64. And I believe it can also return an error. So let's test this just by printing out the tile room, the X, and the Y. And then we'll call this from our init function. Let's see what we get. Cannot find misspelling. Doesn't like a space. Well, that's fine. <clears throat> so what we'll do is we'll just trim each of these individually so that we can tolerate spaces before or after the comma. All right, there we go. So we've got our 1018, 427, 171. Okay, cool. So notice that all it took to parse a file that simple it was just this 40 lines. And we could simplify this more now that we know what we're going to do. <clears throat> and that should be all we need for the index, right? So we avoid having to have a whole dependency on a different library. We don't have to have the complexity of our, our, our lexer or anything uh, <clears throat> because we've just kept it really simple. Okay, so at this point we have enough information to start building up our SDL rectangles and <clears throat> create this textured index. So we're not far from actually drawing our map to the screen with the tiles, but it is already four minutes after, so I'm gonna stop for tonight, and then next episode we'll actually start drawing, drawing our levels with the tiles. Any questions so far before I sign off for tonight? I will hang out for a few minutes, so any questions at all, feel free. Pear Tree says he has an off-topic question. Go ahead. So Pear Tree is wondering uh, if he wanted to make a dialogue tree editor uh, UI. Um, sort of what would I what would I recommend? Um, that's pretty complicated. Like if you just use SDL, then you're basically doing that UI from scratch. Like you'll have to be drawing the plus signs and the lines and expanding things all yourself. Um, probably what you'd want to do is use something like. Uh, uh, Dear, dear I am GUI. Let me see if I can find you a link. So this is a really popular UI for or UI library for games, and it'll let you do. I'm sure it's got a tree thing built in, or if not, it'll have something you can adapt to it. These are just some sample images. I know that there's bindings for this uh, in Go. What I don't know is if you can use it 
with SDL alone. People usually use it with OpenGL, uh, but it might be possible to use it with SDL. I think it's intended to be agnostic to how you're, you're rendering, so it might be possible to use this. So if you're, if you're doing really complex UI, I'd recommend using something like this or just be prepared to do a lot of work. Yeah, so this is a sample of what <clears throat> Pear Tree would like to do. Um, yeah, I mean, just keep, like, this would be a ton of work to do something like this from first principles. So I'd, I'd have a look at uh, libraries like I am GUI. It'll probably take a good bit of figuring out how to set it up, but once you do, it's it's a really good one. <clears throat> All right, I think that's it for tonight. I'm sorry we didn't quite get to drawing our map properly, but uh, we'll be there very soon. And we've got a nice setup where we can uh, swap in different renders really cool. And uh, also a setup where people, like if you were to give this game to a friend, they could make, make their own levels. That's going to be the goal, is that people can make interesting levels just with the text editor. All right. Good night, everyone. I will see you in a couple days.